Now that it's recording, again, I messed up the other night. Rob had a call and told me I had to uh, put the wrong. I didn't I didn't start recording until later. And so y'all were waiting on that to put up there on the website. That was my fault. Rob had to do some digging because of me. All right, so we're going to talk about chest injuries tonight. Uh, we know about trauma. We've dealt, this is a trauma chapter that is pretty in-depth chapter. We know it's pretty rough. Uh, it's pretty hard to uh, So chest traumas, we'll talk about the differences between blunt versus penetrating versus open and impaled. Um, we, we're pretty sure it should be up to speed on that right now, knowing what the difference of those all are um, and how we manage it. What, what are we going to do to them? Uh, we'll talk about the patho assessment of management versus blunt versus penetrating mechanisms, what a hemothorax is. A pneumothorax, is it open, simple, or tension pneumothorax? Um, and, and how to recognize those. What, what are some signs that we can see out the gate that is like, oh, uh, I think that's a pneumo? And then you start listening, and you may hear a couple of things with your stethoscopes that you, then you can turn around and make that work. So you have your cardiac tamponade, you have your rib fractures, flailed chest, and a uh, cumulative cordius. All right, so the introduction parts, we know that 1.2 million people uh, visit the ER every year with chest injuries. This can go from simple uh, blunt force to the chest to um, MVCs. All that classification is based upon how it's, it's, it's charted, how they're triaged. Um, Mm-hmm. Chest injuries can involve the heart, lungs, and greater blood vessels, and they may result of blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, or both. So depending upon what injury and then how, like I said, on how they're triaged, it depends on uh, how they're treated from their own. What we want you to do is we want you to how to treat and recognize what these mechanisms of injuries are. What is uh, normal breathing? What is with uh, how do I respond without any sorts of delay? Um, internal bleeding can collect in the chest cavity. We know uh, we know the like the abdomen can hold up to one liter. Uh, the femur is also another big spot that they can hold a lot of blood. If there's also uh, the abdomen and the pelvic area can be a trap for lots of blood. So you may have air that collects in the chest and prevent the lungs to expand because what it's doing is it's building that pleural space. There's a slideshow that's coming up and it's not letting those lungs fully uh, uh, inhale to their proper size. So then we start to have trouble breathing. I feel like it's a pain because we can't get that full vast of that ox of, of the oxygen. Um, so we'll talk about the anatomy. Remember the difference between the ventilation and oxygenation. So just because you're ventilating them, does it refer to their oxygenation? Are they being oxygen oxygenated correctly? So what I mean by that, just because I'm giving them 15 liters of, of, of oxygen, are they getting correctly oxygenated? Is, am I seeing a change in their O2 sats to increase? If it's not doing anything, I'm, I'm ventilating them, but I'm not oxygenating them. So here, ventilation is the body's ability to move air in and out of the chest and lung tissues. Oxygenation is the process of delivering oxygen to blood by diffusion from the alveoli uh, following inhalation from the lungs. So injuries uh, affect patients' ventilation or oxygenation are serious and may be life-threatening. The chest uh, thoracic cage or up in here in your top part of your chest area extends from the lower end of the neck to the diaphragm. Remember what L, what keeps the diaphragm alive? Y'all can write that in the notes if y'all remember that from the lecture of the night. So a penetrating L injury to the chest. See, somebody's paying attention. We're good. So a penetrating injury to the chest may also penetrate into the lung which is gonna cause a uh, lung failure, it's gonna collapse, uh, that you're gonna have that hemonuma. Um, and it may also injure the liver, spleen, or stomach because it is kind of close to that area. So there may be injuries, multiple trauma areas. So here you can see in your picture, thoracic skin, muscle and bones have similarities to the skin, muscle and bones in other regions of the body. So some of the unique features such as a uh, striated or skeletal muscle, allows ventilation. Oh, let's see here. Uh, what about, hang on. So the intercostal muscles extend between the ribs, uh, not yet developed by very long children who uh, tend to breathe from their diaphragm. They call them belly breathers. Uh, inverted from the spinal nerves allows the chest to expand and contract to the uh, active portion of the ventil ventilation to occur. So in here and you have your ribs, 
and the spot between them, that's what we're talking about when uh, I'll hand me back this up. So if they're so if the kids are just using the belly and they're they're physically making the diaphragm come up and down because they don't have these strider uh, strider muscles, the intercostal muscles in here to make that extend and contract. So we know the diaphragm here, wherever my does all the work. We we got that and we know because the diaphragm, you know, L4 and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. So when it contracts, it controls some it relaxes, the lungs come out. So we have all these that we know how breathing works and you know that starts, you know, from it's a involuntary uh, action that the brains continue. So just remember that uh, majority of your kids are going to be belly breathers and look for that seesaw motion and the kids that start to have uh, respiratory issues because they may, uh, you'll see the chest go up, stomach go in. So it's back and forth. That's why we call it the seesaw. And those are some of the issues that we're going to see uh, only on them. But if you see it in an adult, most likely if you see the chest go out and a little piece comes in, it's going to be a flail chest issue. So you can actually see that uh, where there's a flail chest area. So the so here's the so normally it would go up and down like this. So if there's a flail chest, it's going to inflate and it's going to do this. It's really weird when you see that. So you're probably going to be freaked out a little bit, but you can be like, I know y'all saw that. So the first times it's pretty weird. The first few times I saw it, I was like, whoa, 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 what was that? I, I don't know what I saw. And after a while, I kind of learned, oh, look, that's a flail chest. So the neurovascular bundle lies closely along the uh, margin of each rib. And so what happens is the bundle. So when we go, hold on, let's see how I can, I don't want to skip around. Uh, so anyway, so the neurovascular, the neurovascular bundle is a network of nerves, arteries, and veins that lies closely along the inferior and slightly posterior of the lowest margin of each rib. So it can be a source of significant bleeding into the pleural space. Uh, the pleural, the pleura covers each of the lungs in a thoracic cavity, and the uh, partial pleura uh, is the inner chest wall. The visceral pleural covers the lung, and a small part of the pleural fluid between the peritoneal and the visceral pleural allows the lungs to move freely against the inner chest wall. So it's the one that keeps that friction. It doesn't allow it to stick. Uh, when you have that, that, that doesn't have that stickiness, that's when you start to have uh, respiratory issues. So let me show you right here on this part. So this is where that they're talking about that bundle of nerves come through and the blood vessels and all that. So that's the reason why if you've ever seen that they put a, they uh, decompress the chest, what happens is the needle goes on top of the second and third intercostal. So you would poke, it goes between the second and third intercostal on top of the third. So I'm going to poke them right here. I'm not going to poke them on the bottom of number two because we know that those veins are already running there and it's very nerve, it's very nervy. And I don't mean by like they're nervous, but like the nerves that runs underneath there. So I'm going to take that 14 gauge needle. I'm going to find the tips of the two ribs. I'm going to put my fingers across it. And I'm going to poke right between them. So now you understand why we picked that area. We also can go down here uh, underneath the arm if we believe that you get a, a hemo down in here because that will help the lower part of the blood, the lung, and we can help drain out some of that blood. Because chest tubes go in this area too. So it's the same thing on each one of your ribs. You have those nerves and the blood vessels that come all the way down. So that's why we go between the two. I guess you do a little bit there. Uh, so back to here. So the ribs are connected in the back of the vertebrae and the end and then in the front. Uh, so they connect to the back and to the sternum. The trachea divides into the left and right main stem, bronchia, which supports the airway. So right here, this is, there's a string, mm, this doesn't show it, but there's right here where the airway is connected and goes into each lung, as you can see here. So this is the right and the left main stem. So one is always going to be shorter than the other, and majority of the time it's going to be the left. So if you happen to, sorry, hang on. The right main stem is lower, so it's easier to put the tube when I go to intubate somebody further on the right. So that's the reason why it, it hangs down just a little bit. So when I go to intubate, I can push the tube down into the right main stem. You won't have that issue if you drop an OPA or an MPA, but a lot of times if you're only, if your paramedic is only 
you're getting good ventilations uh, on your right hand side and you're listening to the lungs, just tell your medic, you may be like, hey guys, I think you may be on the right main stem because I don't hear any on the left side. They adjust their tube and try again. Most of the time it works really well and you can hear it. Unless they don't tell you that a uh, grandma had her left lung removed and you're like, uh, well, no wonder I don't hear anything on the left side. So I'm, I've had that happen. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't funny at the time, but it's pretty funny now. The mediastatum contains the central part of the chest containing the heart. A uh, great vessel is esophagus and trachea. The diaphragm is a muscle that separates the trachea cavity from the abdominal cavity. Oh, uh, blah, 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 blah. there's a picture coming up. So the intercostal muscles between each rib, what they do is they contract during inhalation. So it helps you with the diaphragm. So the diaphragm contracts and or flattens out at the same time. The, inter the inner thoracic pressure inside the cavity uh, decreases, which just creates a negative pressure, which helps you breathe in. So this is allow air to enter the lungs because of negative pressure and we're trying to fill that void. The intercostal muscles and the diaphragm relax in ex exhalation. So what that does is allow air to exit. So each time that you breathe, when you, there's that negative pressure that the air is getting rushed back in. All right, so the illustration right here shows the size of the anatomy of the thoracic cavity during inspiration. So as you can see here, so it is relaxed right here and then the diaphragm goes down, so it contracts. So you can see how the breastplate moves up and outward. Uh, the intercostal abdominal muscles contract. What that's doing is it's helping you do for inhalation and it's pushing the air out. So what we want to do is this is what the normal process is. We don't want to have any issues through here, but if we have to, this is the right. This little little bitty spot right here is where we're going to drop that tube for your advances or paramedic, and then it's going to go down to here. So all of these muscles is what we're compressing to do CPR and we're potentially damaging as it continues on. You remember, for each, each minute that they're down, that's a 10% loss on a cardiac ret return rate. So we wanna try to make it quick. So a patient who has a spinal cord injury below the C5 may lose power to move the intercostal muscles. So that right there would be a quadriplegic because all four of their uh, extremities are uh, and, and movable. Oh. The diaphragm stood, should still contract, uh, it depends. Uh, the patient will be stable to breathe because of the phrenic nerves remain in contact. The patient with a C3 or above can lose the ability to breathe. So we see that's pretty high. I mean, a C6 is here, C3 is right here at the base of the skull. Um, so that's where um, we, if they have to be on the ventilators and you know they're able to move around and open their eyes and all that, but they, they can't breathe on their own, that's because they've had at least a C3 injury. Oh, hello. Oh, uh. So the tidal volume is the amount of air moved in and out of the lungs at a single breath. If ever, anybody's ever been in surgery before and you've had the tube put down your throat, they bring you this little contraption. They want you to inhale in and blow out. Respiratory comes in a couple of times, wants you to do this. What they're trying to do is the gift the elasticity built back into your lungs because they come weak and they get really lazy and that's the reason why they want you to do this exercise because once you get back to that peak level you're fine they're moving and they're functioning like they're supposed to be so the average tidal volume for our individual is about 500 milliliters which is a, so that is so your iv bags are a thousand ml so half of an iv bag is 500 mils so that's your average flow. And I'm just kind of give you some example ones so you can think in your head. That's about the average tidal volume. So the minute, vo uh, minute ventilation is calculated, calculated by multiplying the tidal volume by the number of breaths in a minute. Change in either of these numbers can affect the amount of air moving through the system. Hmm. Pretty much so. I don't have to question that because we know that's the truth. And the average bag valve mass can deliver 1,000 to 1,500 milliliters of oxygen and or air, just depending if you're hooked up to a, a supplemental oxygen or not. So overventilation can cause gastric distension, which means that they're going to look like the belly swell them. Overventilation can increase interthoracic pressure, reducing venous return into the heart and nearby reducing cardiac, cardiac output because that pressure has got to go somewhere. So if you start increasing that belly, 
It's either going to come up, it's going to go out the below. I promise you, they're both bad. So be very cautious of that. So if you notice that the belly starts to swell, you need to check your ventilation process because it's not working right. So injuries to the chest. There are two basic types of injuries. You have your open and closed. Now, this one right here looks closed, but I can tell you this. I'm going to assume this is a poor little girl because of the flowers here. But this poor little girl's got a very bad seatbelt burn. And we know that because we've seen them um, that is probably from a high speed. Uh, they're generally, uh, so most of your closed injuries are due to a blunt trauma. It's not because of, uh, I mean, this is, they're going to consider this a blunt trauma because of the seatbelt. It's just like a baseball bat. It's got you. Oh, let's see here. Close chest injuries, they often cause significant contusions which is your bruising and all that, uh, into the, the make a, they also will damage the cardiac, the, the heart, the, because the heart's are also going to muscle and it's going to uh, potentially change rhythm. It can cause swelling of the heart, uh, cardiac contusion is possible. And worst case scenario, we're going to have also a lung tissue issue, which is going to be a pulmonary contusion. If the heart is damaged, it may not be able to refill with blood or may not be able to be pumped out with the force of the heart. So it can be, I mean, it's sensitive. You start messing with your heart enough, it's either not going to pump like it normally should or it's just going to fail on you. So if, if it doesn't pump like it normally should, it's going to result in a cardiac shock. All right, so lung tissues can cause, uh, can result in an extensive uh, exponential loss, if I can get that out, of the surface area. This leads to the decrease of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, and they can cause hypoxic or hypercarb carboc state. Uh, rib fractures are common in these. We know that uh, seat belts can cause those, uh, a lot of broken ribs from and just about anything. Uh, if you have a blunt force uh, injury, uh, you're not going to see those because this is talking about a closed in, a closed chest injuries. Uh, and they can rapidly revert into hypovolemic shock from that state. Um, in chest injuries, an object penetrates the chest wall. Now we have a penetrating issue. So this can cause significant damage, but uh, symptoms develop over time. So it can either stay there or once it's removed, let's talk about a gunshot wound. So in an impaled object does remain in place. So now let's say a stick. We've all seen those nasty videos of these sticks being impaled in people's chest. And they're just like, what? I don't know what you want me to do. Well, it's pretty traumatic for us too. But it's one of those like, oh, hey, what is in your chest? So, but we don't want to leave, we don't want to remove those. We're going to have to leave those in place because we just don't know how to take those out. We don't know if we're removing that of any impelled object that does this cause any other issues or we're going to automatically start causing uh, internal bleeding that we just can't fix. So it's easier if we leave it there and let them worry about that when they get to the facility to have surgery. So a blunt trauma to the chest may cause rib fractures, uh, damage to the sternum and to the chest wall. You're gonna have severe bruising to that area. So you may have visible visible bruising to the chest, uh, black splotches, uh, depends on what was hit. You may look like the little young girl on there and she may, and you may have bruising from the seatbelt. But almost one third of people killed immediately in a car crash die result of a traumatic rupture to the aorta. So there's really, I hate to say it, there's nothing that we can do for them besides be there for them. If we happen to know that and they say, I, I think I'm fisting to die, they, they know that is one of those overall feelings that they're, they, just, they just know that things aren't too good. Um, so when you have those injuries to the chest, if it's a traumatic incident or you have death in the same vehicle, and somebody's complaining of chest pain, treat, y'all need to go fast, but do a, but go slow pace. Uh, recognize that issue, treat it pretty fast, and be like, you know, this could be a damaging to the aortic valve. Well, we can't fix that out here. And we're 20 minutes from the hospital, we need to go. But at the same time, you don't want to jerk that patient. You don't want to slam them around. You don't, you need to give them care but be cautious when you do that because you don't want to cause any other, any other pain or potentially death to the patient. 
So signs and symptoms of a chest injuries, uh, pain at the site of uh, origin. Um, they may be like, it hurts right here, or it hurts right here. Oh, all right. Well, if it hurts right here, tell me what hurts the most. All of this hurts the most. Hmm. And I guess it's a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale. No, it's a 20. Well, I'm sorry, I was wrong. You know, we all have those people that are like that. So pain is localized to the site of the injury and it's aggravated by the increase. So the more that they breathe, like, oh, it hurts to breathe. Oh, well, shut up. Don't, don't talk. That, that's, I like that everybody talks. So I can't breathe. Well, you talking. So obviously you can breathe. So if you can't breathe, then let's just write everything down. Uh, and I like to give them yes or no answers. Do you remember what happened? Yes. I, just nod your head or shake your head. Don't talk. It helps you out too. So again, we have bruising. We may have crepitus. Now remember the crepitus with palpation to the chest is when I take and do this, it feels like Rice Krispie sounds. And y'all know what I'm talking about. That snap, crackle, pop. You're like, and you're just like, Phew. I'm going to tell y'all, uh, Tuesday night, we had a huge issue in our county. Um, and they really were calling any paramedic to come out and work. So after class, about 10 o'clock at night, I went and worked. Um, Ended up taking care of an elderly lady, and I literally went there because she slipped, tripped, and fell, and she didn't, didn't have a whole lot of hair on her head anyway, but she had some uh, abrasions to the top of her head. Her blood pressure was 288 over 128, and I was like, oh, God, let's check, let's, let's check that somewhere else in another arm. That's, that's just not good. Was still in the high 200s. So when I went to start an IV on her, her right arm had already looked bad because she had just got out of the hospital a couple of days ago. But when I grabbed her arm and, and tilted her wrist a little bit, I could feel that. And I was like, oh, what's wrong with your wrist? Mm, nothing. I think something's wrong with your wrist. And she's like, and you could feel it because I'm holding her hand. And it's just like, you, you can stop all that. that. That's cool. But so it's, it's one of those things. If we talk about decrepitus and it, it, you can feel those, they're pretty predominant because you're just like, well, What's that that gets your attention? Any penetrating trauma to the chest is gonna get your attention because you're at the same time you're like, why is it, why is there a hole right here? What would you do to get this hole right here? Um, and shortness of breath when they answering your questions like this because they can't breathe. Well, when you notice that or they can say, I felt a burning sensation to the to the, my chest. Do a full assessment. Make sure when you assess them, that you, you physically touch, look, look in the underarm, uh, run your hands up in there, make sure they weren't shot in the underarm because sometimes those can feel themselves back. Um, look in the belly button. I've seen people be stabbed there and you never know because the belly was able to close it back. Look for those signs, those bruising, the dyspnea, the crepitus. Uh, majority of the time you're gonna feel crepitus in the upper part of the chest down to about nipple line area and then up and around in here. Majority of the time, if you feel it, you're gonna notice it up in here because of the air has got into the upper pockets and, the, and then it rises. Um, I don't know, and I'm not going into detail, who all is hunters in here, but if you are a hunter and you happen to, uh, let's say a deer, and you go to skin the deer, you can see those um, air pockets form a lot, depends on where you shot your deer. And when you go to skin them, you can see those pockets. And I will tell you, I, I teach my kids that way I use the, the animal but and I let them feel it and I put the skin back and let them feel it and I say look now this is what this is um so if you happen to do that and you hunt this coming up here look for that you'll be able to see those signs and symptoms um let's see here low oxygen stats that's that's gonna be indicative because they can't breathe. Well, you want to know why they can't breathe. So you're going to use all your, uh, a set, you're going to use all your tools and your tools are going to show you, hey, he's having trouble breathing. So uh, diminished breath sounds on one side. You may have hemonumal or collapsed lung. Synosis around the fingers or lips. These are going to turn blue. Your fingernail pads, see all of ours look, should look like that. When I go to pinch it, notice how quick the pink returns. See the white disappears less than two seconds so that should be normal when that's there if it takes longer than two seconds they're not oxygenated correctly those are some of those um they're more 
entitled to work very well on younger kids. Uh, I would say younger people, but um, it specifically if they're smokers, it's just not going to work. That you're not going to be able to find out that, that about that. Checking the fingers, um, and then the rest of you just going to check your blood pressure. Um, if you're looking at the patient and they're having trouble breathing, uh, when they breathe and their chest goes up and it's kind of tilted, one side's not coming up as well as the other one, that may be signs of a, a chest injury or a traumatic injury to the chest. Patients with chest injuries also ha uh, potentially have rapid respirations, so that's apnea, and shallow respiration because it hurts to breathe. So it's going to be... It's just because they can't breathe deep, it hurts. It hurts so bad. And they're just like, I can't take a deep breath. Well, why? You know, what, what, brought, what happened two, three days ago? And that's the reason why you always like to ask, have you been involved in a car wreck in the past 12 to 24 hours? Because those could be late signs that produce because they may have that bruising or the lung that's collapsed that, now, that has now failed because of... Uh, an issue that they are just masking and trying to get past it. Um, so scene size up. Uh, I don't know what time it is. All right. So scene safety, if, if the area is safe for me to enter, I'll be. If it's a crime scene, don't go there until PD's there. Even if you just get the notes and you're just like, this just doesn't sound good. Can we get PD in or out? Um, uh, I'm an advocate on bringing fire to your scenes um, because I'm getting older and wiser. Let's use that word instead of older and shit hurts when you take a deep breath. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, I'm just not that spring chicken anymore. So bring the fire there. Let them help you with assistance. Let them work with you. Let them help you. And the more eyes, the merrier. Things that help you will benefit you pretty drastically. Um, uh, request for assistance for law enforcement. We've already said that. Call for ALF. Um, I noticed the one here says uh, request utility fire department ALS unit early. Utility, I'm assuming that they're talking about under MVC situation so they can cut the power because fire department can't do that either. Um, chest injuries are common in all motor vehicle accidents. Uh, you have your falls, your industry, your industry accidents. That got me there. So on every vehicle crash, I make it a point to say, hey, sir or ma'am, do you mind if I, uh, and I, I want to assess your chest for well. What's going to involve in that is me poking around on your chest a little bit with just my fingers. I won't be using my hand. I'm going to poke around. I said, I will feel you know, down the center of your chest. Ma'am, this may be, you know, not normal what you're used to. It could go between your breastplate, but I'm not going to go to the east side. What I want to make sure is that you have uh, firmness in your chest plate. That's something that they don't want to do and allow. That's perfectly fine. And I may just ask them, hey, do me a favor and just push. Is any of that tender? Now do this, step it out. Is any of that tender? And at the same time as I want to assess it, but again, I need to protect that and respect that patient's ability. If that's something they're not comfortable with, I, I get it. It's not my problem. And I can note that in my notes when I go to, due to uh, such and such situation, a uh, patient was allowed to palpate her own chest, uh, was no time and place or warranted place where I could screen the person from public view, I allowed the patient to palpate her own chest. The patient denied any pain and or tenderness to the areas. And I'm covered. I did everything I could. Um, so anytime that you talk about a scene size, look for your number of patients. I know, I don't guess I've said that enough, but even when you go and you're getting questions, just like, you know, BVI is just three car NBC. Uh, how many patients are there? You know, dispatch, control, whatever. Um, unaware at this time. Okay, can you do me a favor? Go ahead and soft roll me another unit this way. And what I mean by that is I, I don't, I want to slow roll a unit. I don't want to tell them to come license sirens because I can potentially cancel them if I don't need them. You know, hey, look, I'm about five minutes out. Go ahead and slow roll me a unit this way. I said, I'll cancel you as soon as I get there and realize I don't need them. It may warrant me doing six refusals, but at the same time, if it's six refusals, I may go ahead and let that other unit come down and pick up at least three refusals to help me out um, because it doesn't warrant me to do three, six refusals and be down for two and hours to write reports. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Uh, Making an injury, what, I just want to know what caused it. That's really it. Primary assessment, we should know these primary assessments now. I want to assess my ABCs. 
Do I see any life-threatening issues? If I do, fix them. And then continue to carry on my rapid assessment. That's all I'm worried about. ABCs, are they breathing? And then that gives you time when you do that. I like to do, no matter what, head and chest initial inspection. Because I can look at their, their abdomen later on when I'm coming down further to do their physical exam. But most of the time here to my chest is going to tell me if they're having any trouble breathing. What does it look like? And are they circulating well? Because I can look at their chest as I'm going, okay, hey, do me a favor. Talk to me real quick. Tell me what's your last thing you remember. And I'm DCAP BTLS in it to that point as I'm checking my ABCs. I'll also feel around the neck, make sure that I have midline because I don't want the the airway, the Adam's apple and all that to be shifted to either side. That's a bad thing. If y'all remember, one, that's a bad thing because then we're going to have issues with one of the lungs or you may have a complete mid uh, uh, deviation or you know, it, it's going to be for a long night if we don't check that early. Why is it not checking? Uh, look for equal expansion of the chest wall. Again, are they breathing? Are they breathing adequately? And are they oxygenating their cells along with ventilation properly? Uh, apply close addressing to the chest of all penetrating injuries. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, so any, because we don't, if it's penetrating besides, if it's, we can't see the beginning or the end of it. Uh, let's say it's a, a GSW. So I want to do a three-sided occlusive dressing to allow it to burp. Apply oxygen should be our first thing, no matter what. And, and when we apply that, we're going to try to apply it to at least 15 liters a minute. If they can't stand it enough because you're putting on a mask to them, go with a nasal cannula. That's fine. But make sure you have it ready because you may have to step it back up. Be alert for all your decreased uh, ventilations. Uh, be alert for decreased of O2 stats. And make sure when you say it's saturations, don't be like it's O2 stats because it is not as it's not stats. It's S T. It's S A T versus stats. That's a pet people, man. I hate to hear those. His O2 stats are sitting. No, they're not. He didn't have he didn't have stats on how his life is. That's the baseball players and footballs. As you see, it's pet peeve. Um, so here, what I want to do is the first that's on your screen. I just want to make sure, do the, what is their skin color, temp, and condition? Answer your question, move right on. Transport decision. We stay in a plane and we go, and boys, that's all I need to know. Um, a lot of the times, if I have a new EMT or a new uh, hire patient, I like to tell them, hey, look, for the first six hours, here's how things are going to work. I'm going to run the patient calls. I'm going to make sure I do everything. You're going to assist me. My partner that drives the ambulance most of the time, well, we, I like to drive too, so I can't really say that. But my partner is going to help me. We're going to work through this. You're going to see what your role is. Now, for the next, for the second half of the six hours, you're going to be in charge of the patient and I'm going to help you. My partner, they're going to get in the front of the truck. So it's just you and I. So because I want you to, the way that I like to say is look, uh, hold on. See one, do one, teach one. I want, to, I want you to see how it's done. I want you to do it. Then I want you to teach me how you do it. So after it's over, I may be like, hey, so now I need you to tell me how to take a set of vitals. Most time you get this like, what do you mean? I want to know, you're com just make sure you pick up what you're putting down. Just because you see it and feel it here, can you talk me through it? That's important to me. Um, so here's your... Uh, most of your deadly dozens for chest injuries, these are the ones that will kill you faster than anything. And they rank them through one through 10. I don't think that's their ranking score, but we know that that's a, uh, the top 12 that's going to kill you pretty quick. So in their history, we know it's the same thing as every single other patient. Get your sample. Make sure you can get that at least uh, by the patient and or family. It is nice to get both of them. And when they say, you know, Mr. Fred, hey, can you tell me what happened yesterday? Well, he was in a wreck. Okay, I, I get he was in a wreck, but Mr. Fred, were you in a wreck? Do you remember the wreck? And the reason why I say that is because I want to make sure that they remember things. What's their cognitive ability? And then I can assess their, their speech. Are they able to comprehend it, listen to it, and then talk about it? Or what I really hate is when the patient and the bystander start arguing. 
that ain't getting nowhere. Most of the time I tell the bystander to move on or, or I'll come talk to him in just a minute. But let me talk to Mr. Fred, if you don't mind, I appreciate it. Now be careful when you do something like that, trying to obtain history from a juvenile because the juvenile, specifically young ladies uh, that potentially have abdominal pain, we go more towards pregnancies. Um, they're not gonna answer those questions around their mother or their father's majority of the time. So a lot of that's just gonna be asking once you get into the ambulance. And then what we like to say is, oh, I wanna ride with her. No, ma'am, I'm sorry, our insurance doesn't allow that because we can only ride the patient. If something's happened, I'm going to have to figure out which one of you, your lives are more important, and I'm going to have to make that decision. I would like for you not to make that decision happen tonight, but just in a worst case scenario, I, I, let's, let's just let us three ride together if that's okay. If you want, go ahead and go on to the hospital. We're going to sit outside for just a second. I'm going to start an IV, do some stuff like this and that, and you all can go ahead and get her checked in, so that will, wrap, that will make it a little bit rapper for you all to get back. Now, the good thing is now, due to COVID, not a lot of people are able to come back. Um, a lot of the times, unless you're, I think UMC, which is our, our trauma center here, you have to be 12 or 15 or younger and a parent is able to come back. Anything that's over, they don't really allow parents to come back because of the COVID and all these restrictions and all that crap. So kind of get some information from them as you're going down the road. Um, physical exam. So now I want to go to, I want to do the isolated injury. I want to figure out what is wrong and I need to touch it, fix it. And let's do the best thing we can. Sorry, y'all, my deer cameras are going off. Um, so what body region was affected? I need to know, what, where do I have a multi-system trauma? Do I have um, an underlining system that is affected that I'm not able to see and or what's going on when I'm checking their vitals? If it's a traumatic issue, we're gonna check every five minutes. If it's non-critical, we're gonna do it every 10 to 15. Um, I want to check the anterior and posterior of the chest. Now, granted, I can't stick my hands in their body and feel the inside of the chest to check the posterior, but I want to make sure to check their chest wall and I need to check their back. Listen, at that point in time, listen to them breathe, put your stethoscope on, do an assessment. Because if I, I was working the other night, as I told you, one of the fire guys showed up on a call and it, like they, were, they did a full assessment and never put their hands on them. I didn't say anything to him. I just thought it was disrespectful to call him out on scene. But if you're not touching them, how can you assess them? Um, that's like here. If you go to buy a new car, do you drive it to see if you like it? Well, yeah. So how are you going to assess your patient fully and not put your hands on them? So for you to say, okay, well, they're having, you know, they're breathing 16 times a minute. Well, that's easy. I can say that too because I'm counting their respirations. But if I don't put my hands on them, I don't know exactly where they are. You're not assessing that patient is what I want y'all to understand by when I'm talking about anterior and posterior there. Uh, changes in the patient's ability to maintain adequate respirations. What has caused it? What was their initial respiratory rate and depth? And as we're going eight minutes deeper into the scene or on the call, the patient is declining their respiratory rate. But, but why? Well, I may not be able to know that if I didn't do a good assessment. So now we're here to do the physical so we can go to all these areas and start getting uh, some, some one on answers. Uh, for significant trauma like affecting multiple systems, start with a rapid physical exam and use your DCAP BTLS for every part of the body. I like to, when I'm doing an in depth chart, I will start at the head. I'll do head, chest, abdomen, pelvic, extremities and fingers and toes are included into extremities. And I will put head, DCAP, BTLS. And then I will say positive, like use a little positive symbol for D, for uh, deformities uh, d d d here, uh, negative uh, CAPT, uh, BTLS. Um, I'm very de descriptive into that because remember, you gotta remember these charts for years to come, if you take care of an infant, they got 18 years to sue you. It's like paying child support that you don't know about on these babies. How's that? Pretty got you on that one. All right, so on your secondary assessment, uh, this should also be included in your primary. Um, if there's two of you, you work in teams. You notice firefighters are always in teams. EMS goes in teams. Uh, most of the time, your police officers goes in twos too. So don't think that you have to do all of this at one freaking time. Hey, I'm going to get my partner to check the set of vitals for me. 
Hey, I'm also got my partner to uh, head maintain their, uh, their C spine mobilization and go down the chart. You should be, you should know at this point, you should know, I mean, know your uh, national registration checkoff skills. Those are important. So you can dictate of who your partner helping you. You may have a physical partner or you may have just say, hey, look, you know, ghost man's on first. If y'all remember playing baseball back in the day. So when you have those, hey, at this point, I'm going to have my partner to do this. Da, 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 and I'm going to do this, this and this. OK, no matter what, if you did it or you made your partner do it, go back and check on it. How is it? Now, just because I applied 15 liters of O2 when they were breathing 12 times a minute, did it help them? Well, yeah, it's my patient, my story, right? I'm just kidding. Um, so here it talks about do your reassessments for your revaluation. I, again, this is on transportation to the hospital. Um, reassess all of that airway, breathing, pulse, perfusion, and bleeding. Make sure that nothing has changed. Again, we don't want to cause any harm. But if we don't go back and double check on this, we, we don't know if we can, and we can note that we made their improvement. So we got to do something. Um, interventions, again, um, if you provide a, a stabilization to the patient who have had blunt trauma spectrum spinal injuries, uh, reassess that, no noted, in, no noted other issues from the C collar, control significant uh, bleeding, you should control that in the beginning because that's a life threatening issue. And then if you have the ability to put a chest seal on, the, on there or a uh, semi-vented dressing, which is the three-sided occlusive dressing over the penetrating chest injury. Uh, hmm. um, provide aggressive treatment for shock and transport rapidly. Communication and documentation. Uh, communicate all relevant information to the staff receiving hospital. Everything you did, you've done, you worked and all that, you, you got to make sure that it's good. You got to make sure what you did and how you did it is all good to go. So, got to make sure you, your documentation is good. What you did, you need to transfer over in speech to your hospital. A lot of your facilities now don't do physical paperwork handoff unless you're given something from a transfer or something like that over to the facility. So, your paperwork is sent to the facility at a later point in time. And what that does is it, uh, it attaches to the patient's file later down the road. At, at what point, I'm not sure, but that's how they're sent now. You still make sure you get the staff to sign your paperwork. And then, uh, cause that means that they physically have read it. They have been given an understanding and that's their patient now. Cause you can say, hey, Miss or Mr. C. Wally uh, took the patient from me at such and such time. So what is a pneumothorax? So, um, so a pneumothorax is defined as an accumulation of air in the pleural space. It's not supposed to be there, but it does. So air enters through a hole in a chest wall uh, or a surface of the lung. Uh, the patient's attempt to breathe, causing the lung on that side to collapse. So it's just taking, it's taking more room from the lung itself. Uh, blood passing through the collapsed portion of the lung is not oxygenated at all. Um, breath sounds on the affected side chest wall will indi indicati indicative of different conditions. If the lung is collapsed to past 30 to 40 percent, you may hear diminished breath sounds. So you're going to hear good breath sounds on one side and not on the other side. Absent breath sounds indic uh, uh, tell you that, the, that they do have a potential tension pneumothorax. Sucking sounds on inhalation is a telltale sign of, a, of air rushing into something. You know, it's like um, pumping a hole in a balloon. You hear the same way. Um, and that tells you also that the chest wall has been penetrated. Something there is causing it. Uh, you can hear the as it happens also. Charlie, stand up, please. Sorry, I'm having fuss with my child. All right, so here's an, an illustration right here. So here's our little air leak. So what's happening is, is the air is rushing to this pleural space, creating the lung to collapse because now the pressure out here is higher than what is inside the lung. 
because most of the time this is a, a negative pressure, so I say, which allows this to come contract back and forth. Well, this should be a zero pressure chamber and your negative and positive is all inside your lungs. Because you can see this one has not failed. This is probably gonna be decreased less than 30 to 40%. So you're gonna hear great breath sounds on the, this side of the patient versus this side of the patient. It depends if this is uh, from the chest wall or this is happening underneath the chest wall. You could hear that uh, the, the, the sucking chest wound or you potentially be able to see the penetrating chest wound. Uh, here, all right, so open chest wound is often called a pneumothorax or a sucking chest wound. Um, after clearing and maintaining a patient's airway and providing oxygen, these wounds may be rapidly sealed with an occlusive dressing. We don't have to have a chest seal. Um, a lot of your agencies are required to have them now, but you can still do that with, I like sandwich bags better than these $400 chest seals, but I mean, they're good. Don't get me wrong, the chest seals are great, but it's still, a lot of your chest seals initially when they came out, they were white and you couldn't see them, but now they're clear with the little with the little uh, one way, I call them the uh, the fart valve off of the, um, with the little the little toys that you sit on. It makes it a little sound like, but it's just a one way clapper valve. Um, occlusive dressing with the flutter valve may be taped on the patient if you got it. If not, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna put that three sided tape on there and let, let gravity do its best. Um, that's how we're gonna work at uh, that pneumothorax. So as you can see here, this is a through and through from the from the outer chest wall. So you're gonna allow air out. You should you might see a little bit of blood. Uh, this is gonna be between the two uh, second and third rib right here. Uh, and you're gonna hear that rushing of air. Now at the same time as you can trap that with your gloved hand. And I do remind you gloved hand because what's on your potential hand or coming from their body is nasty. I don't, I don't want to, you can keep yours. So at this point, what we'll do is we'll put uh, uh, an occlusive dressing over this. And I initially, I tell everybody, cover this with your gloved hand. And that allows you or your partner to get something out of the bag. You're able to move one thing with the hand. Or at the same time, you can tell your patient if they're coherent enough to cover it with their hand. So... Yeah, I'm going to let y'all take a vote. It has been almost an hour now. We have exactly 67 slides. And hang on, I got to do something real quick so I can tell you right. We're on 45 of 60 something. Do y'all want to continue or y'all want to take a quick break? Knock it out, man. Let's get it done. Yeah, I mean, there's not much to this. So, I mean, I think we all, okay, that's at least two has voted. We good. The other eight of y'all don't count, and no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, so the simple th pneumothorax is, so it does not, it's not gonna make major changes. Um, it's still gonna have cardiac issues. You're still gonna notice that there's gonna be some um, effects going on there. So this is gonna be, it's a commonly resulted by a penetrating trauma injury. Uh, signs and symptoms include penetrating pleuric chest injury, sorry. Dyspnea, tachycardia, accessory muscles used, decreased oxygen saturation, and cracking sensation uh, felt on palpation of the skin. So that is subcutaneous emphysema. That's what I was trying to, should have thought of that earlier, but that's what you're feeling and hearing. You're like snap, crackle, pop. You're like, oh, that's gross. I don't want to touch that again. So late findings is going to be decreased breath sounds and probably lethargia. A lot of cyanosis is going to take effect. The best thing that we can do, I know when I say provide high flow O2 and you're thinking, well, it's leaking into the chest wall water. We want to do that. But we need to make sure that they're getting oxygenated and that once we have fixed this, the simple pneumothorax or tried to provide patient care to them that we're able to move forward and be like, okay, we can do this. But you're still going to have to give them O2 because you're going to look at their O2 sats and say, oh, God, they're they're in the low 90s, you know, upper 80s. They they could be intubated. Well, that is true. So if we at least apply oxygen, we we have a better feeling that they're going to be able to get oxygenated better without a supply of anything that's what's floating around natural air. 
So a tension pneumothorax results from ongoing air accumulation in the pleural space. The air gradually increases the pressure in the chest. Ooh. Um, mediastinum is pushed to the opposite side. So that's where we get the shifting, what I was telling you about. So this is the, the tension pneumo. It's going to create the uh, shift of the uh, metastadium. And more commonly caused by blunt injury in which a fractured rib lacerates the lung or the bronchial. Common signs and symptoms include chest pain, tachycardia, marked respiratory distress, uh, low and rapid dropping oxygen saturations. Now, we, when you see their O2 sets, I'm going to stop and say that when you think, because you're like, oh, they're diving off. No, it's going to it's going to drop, drop, and then it's gradually going to drop. So you will, you're not going to get them back high if you don't react early enough. So what I want you to do is, if you suspect any chest wall trauma or any, I should go with any trauma period, apply high flow O2 first. So presence may present of the JVD. Remember the other night I showed you all that when that dude was sitting here that was popping back and forth, which is still crazy to me. That's JVD. Cyanosis, we're going to have the blueness and the purpleness around the lip. Uh, tracheal deviation, the midline here is going to go one side or the other. If it shifts to the right, we know that the left side is the one that's affected. Uh, but these signs may not always be present, but they, those are tail signs of when you see them. You're, they, can, they can and will be late. But uh, what we can only do in the pre-hospital setting as an EMT basic is provide high flow O2. So here is a uh, illustration of a tension pneumothorax. So you see here, here's the wound, and this is applying pressure at all different places, which has caused, oh, I wish you could see my hands. So anyway, so you, you, what's happening is the tension's building up over here, and it's causing everything to shift because that pressure has nowhere to go. Now, if you'll notice what's wrong here, that is a four-sided occlusion. How, how is it going to let pressure out? It needs to burp. Um, back in the day, what they used to tell us is we would do a foresight and we would burp it every so often. Well, I don't, I mean, I, I ain't got multiple brains. I'm, I'm ready to go and let's fix this and move on. No, no, no. Well, sometimes people forget. And that's where you can kind of see this, the, the deviation and the pushing of the, uh, it sucks because you forget you're like, Oh, I forgot to burp that a few minutes ago. So problem. Um, so uh, hemothorax is a condition which blood uh, collects into the pleural space from bleeding around the rib cage. And remember, we know where that can, hang on, let me see if I can. So remember, if you're right around the bottom of your ribs, right here on your, so this is, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, remember right on the bottom side and sometimes posterior of your ribs, you have all those nerves and the blood vessels. So there's damage there, you're probably gonna be bleeding from that area too, uh, and that can fill in the space. So here is a hemothorax. So what is happening is blood filled the pleural space, and this is a hemothorax, this is a hemonumo, because it's halfway filled with blood and halfway filled with air. They both have to exit, and majority of the time, these are going to get chest tubes. Um, if I was to poke them with a 14 gauge needle, uh, and I did it right here between the second and third intercostal, I might drain it that much. And you're going to be like, oh, God, there's blood everywhere. Maybe I messed up. Well, if you pull it out, now you, you still got problems. So if you recognize that issue, you're going to have to treat that initially. Now, I know y'all can't do needle decompressions, and that's fine. But I at least want y'all to understand where they go and why we do chest tubes so low. Well, we got to get all the blood out somehow so we can allow the lungs to start expanding and contracting like normal. Um, suspect the hemothorax if the patient has signs and symptoms of shock without any obvious external bleeding. Because it's going somewhere, you notice the difference, the difference between the blood uh, pressures and the vital signs from your first, second, third time. And you're like, there's, they got to be losing blood somewhere, somehow, and it's going somewhere. So start paying attention to your respiratory rate, and maybe that'll tell you, well, they're not breathing really well on the right side. That may tell you that they have a hemo or pneumo on the side. What we want to do here is we want to rapidly transport them to the hospital. Uh, hemothorax uh, is the presence of air and blood. We talked about that. We showed you the picture. So a cardiac tamponade. So a cardiac tamponade, 
It's also a pericardial tamponade occurs when the pericardial sac fills with blood. So here's your picture so you can get an idea. So here's your normal heart right in here. It has this little nice little cool sac around it. That creates perfect hemostasis for that heart on a normal basis. Here we have swelling or pericarditis, pericardial. Uh, this is a pericardial tam tamponade because now there's blood that's swelling around the heart. So once we have that, we know that's not good. Now, how are we going to notice that in the field is right now is EMT basic? You not, I mean, you not really, just you're going to go with it and take them to the hospital. But here's you some signs and symptoms. So you have your Beck triad. Remember, we talked about the Beck triad. You're going to have the blood pressure, respiratory rate, and pulse pressure are all going to be uh, differentiate. You're going to have, what is that? Y'all remember, help me remember what the Beck triad is. Decrease, increase blood pressure, uh, increase pulse rate. I'm waiting on y'all to catch in anytime. Y'all Google it real quick. I know what y'all doing. Mm -hmm. Come on, Rebecca. Decreased respiration rate. Decreased blood pressure. And increased pulse pressure. Because the heart is trying to pump to get that blood pressure back to normal and it's just not going to. So what are we going to do in the free hospital? We, we're going to pour diesel through it and transport it. That's all we can do. And I don't want them. I need to hurry and get them out of my truck. Probably going to go license and firing back to the hospital. Rib fractures, um, obviously, they have to go to the facility. We, we can't do that. Um, a lot of people will be like, oh, I'll be fine. I'm not going to the hospital. Okay, you'll die. We'll pronounce you dead later. It's cool. It doesn't bother me a bit. Um, so we know that that can happen for many things, you know, uh, slip, trip, and fall, uh, penetr I mean, uh, blunt force injuries, car wrecks. Um, we're all human. We make stupid mistakes. We just do crazy things. And it happens. So, but fractured ribs. My son just had baseball tryouts. I'm waiting to find out how that goes too. So, rib fracture may lacerate the surface of the lung, cause a pneumo or hemo, and it can create damage to the liver and to the spleen. So, be cautious of that, um, especially if it's the spleen. Uh, keep an eye on their blood pressures. Uh, notice that there's any change because the internal bleeding is going to collect into the abdomen. When you're doing a full assessment, you want the soft, uh, rigid abdomen. You don't want the distended and firm because you're like, oh, God, there's something in there. And he ain't got no six packs, so something wrong. Um, only thing we can do here is supply supplemental oxygen. Um, as you can see right here, this is a flail chest. So these, these are broken on two different sides. So what's gonna happen is they're still gonna be in place. They're not just gonna float throughout the body, but they're gonna move separately and it's gonna create a lot of pain. So what we'll tell you is no matter what, is majority of your trucks are still going to have IV bags on there, or at least should have a, at least one pillow or some blankets it's starting to get cold in some parts of the country. It's not in the South, but... So we wanna take and pad that area. We wanna put something firm but soft against them in my time when I started, we used to carry sandbags on the trucks just for flail chest. Yes, I know, I said sandbags, it's not all that, it's just what we used. And what it is is because we wanna apply pressure to that flail chest so it can move up and down, because right now it's moving like this and it's, and it's, grab, it's, it's scrubbing those ribs and it hurts. So that's why there's a lot of pain there. So if we can apply pressure, a light constant pressure, and we can start doing this. We can breathe, make them breathe, uh, with their lungs, uh, with all their ribs going up and down at the same time. We want to the so from things some so the paradoxal motion is a late sign of flail chest. So remember that. So the deep portion, the detached portion of the chest wall moves opposite opposite of the normal. So that's where we get this. So the ribs go up and down like this when we breathe. So if they're broken, they're going to do this when they breathe. It's painful because they scrub. So that's where you get your paradoxal motion. Uh, Pre-treatment, maintain the airway, provide respiratory support, supplemental oxygen if you can. Like I told you about applying the um, pressure blanket. Now, again, I'm not going to walk up and be like, oh, here's a 10-pound weight. Put that on your chest. No, because at the same time, we have to stabilize it. 
transport it in a safely manner. But IV bags work great, pillows work great, um, blankets work great. And that's one of those you can apply it in an area, you can tape it down, you can let the patient hold itself. It, I'm not gonna tell you how to do every single one of them because it's gonna happen to where they're gonna happen in all different ways. It's just one of those things that happens. Um, treatment, mass, blue pot of pressure ventilation. So applying high flow O2 helps. Not gonna say it's gonna fix it every single time. Because you're, you're, what you're trying to do is apply that positive pressure inside the, inside the chest, but we don't have enough pressure, like a CPAP, like a positive pressure CPAP, is just not going to be enough to stop it. So you're going to have to apply the, the pressure somewhere. Some other chest injuries, uh, pulmonary contusion, they should always be suspected in a patient with a chest injury. Um, the pulmonary alveolar become filled with blood and fill in blood field accumulates in the engine air injured area, leaving the patient hypoxic. Again, pre-hospital treatment is oxygen. If you notice, there's a lot of things that we can't do. Um, also check with your state. Some states allow you as EMT basis to do a lot more. Um, I speak of Mississippi, we're a little far behind. I think we could do a lot of different things at different levels. We're working on it. We just got to get past the 1900s and uh, move into the 22nd century and uh, allow people to practice medicine and not cookie cut it. Yeah, that was my little vent. Sorry about that, y'all. Um, some other fractures, you'll see sternal fractures. Oh, I've seen clavicle fractures before. Uh, matter of fact, the one, the two, particular two separate ones I've seen, a person was carrying a battery on their shoulder going downstairs and somehow the weight of the battery broke their collarbone. That was really painful. The dudes were cool. And you notice I said dudes because see men do a lot more stupid things than women do. So we have more men and patients. But anyway, so no matter what of those, you're not going to be stabilized. You're not going to make them comfortable. Their arms going to be want to, they want to hold it just like this. They're like, all right, I'm ready to go. Don't touch me, but I'm ready to go. Uh, those are cool. The sternal fractures, obviously it's going to be broken somewhere in here. It's just, un, it's just very, very painful. So you can have traumatic asphyxiation. So this is sudden severe compression of the chest wall, which produces rapid increase of pressure with chest. So what I think of here, and which I'll see on this one, is I think the best way for me to tell you how to do traumatic asphyxiation is if you have a farming area around you and you have people that have grain, grain bins, corn, right, uh, not wheat, stuff like that, and they go to remove those uh the storage onto a truck to haul to the you know to factory wherever they have a lot of asphyxiation issues because the people will get in there and walk on top of the product trying to push it down to the the wheels well they'll find that soft spot and they'll get sucked in well the pressure of the corn and all that fills that void because now there's not a pocket it's a body there and that's a traumatic asphyxiation the same thing in snow it doesn't allow for you to react and get that chest wall movement it's just going to get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter to where you're done. And you'll look on this picture, you'll see the chest and all that looks looks okay, but you notice right around in here, because that's where all the blood's rushing to because they just, they're, they're done. They, they get all that. Is, you see how swollen the neck is here? And I say that because you see how uh, tight this chain appears to be, uh, the bulging of the eyes. That's going to be hints of a traumatic asphyxiation. Um, suggest an underlying injuries, uh, possible heart, uh, pulmonary, pulmonary contusion. Ooh. Provide military support oxygen. Most of the time, these are just this. By the time you see them, they, they, they done. We can't do nothing. They, they, they dead. I'm sorry. That's it. Um, blunt myocardial and, uh, injuries. So blunt trauma may injure the heart itself, making it unable to maintain adequate blood pressures. Uh, you'll get one of those like off the wall blood pressure once. The next time it'll be normal. The next time it is just they're crazy numbers. They never be like within a, a box of each other. They're going to be high, low, all over the place. Um, often the pulse is going to be irregular in this point. It is going to be dangerous rhythm such as ventricular tachycardia, uh, ventricular uh, V-fib will happen. Those are... It's not gonna always happen. You can see those uh, rhythms, 
Um, if your partner is a, is a good enough partner to teach you some of the rhythms, uh, you, you'll be able to pick up on their, uh, their instability of life. Uh, suspect myocardial contusion in cases where blunt trauma to the chest. There's, if you, every time that there's an injury to the chest, you're like, oh, do they have, a, you know, is it going to cause traumatic asphyxiation or is it going to be a myocardial injury? Bro, I don't know either. I don't. I, I mean, I guess I've gotten to a point now. I'm like, I'll take them to the hospital and then call it to the hospital and be like, hey, what y'all diagnose them with? Well, let me learn something here. Um, that's every suspect everything. Um, blunt uh, myocardial intrusions run to the patients carefully. We're going to do that. We're going to apply our tools. We're going to check their pulse ox. We're going to check their uh, O2 saturations. We're going to make sure that their blood pressures have been monitored every five minutes. And we're going to make sure that they're comfortable and uh, relaxing uh, as we transport them to the hospital. Um, Komodo cardis, uh, as blunt injury to the chest caused by sudden direct blow to the chest occurs only during critical portions of the person's heartbeat, resulting in immediate cardiac arrest. They did. The resulting ventricular fibrillation is often responsive too responsive to defibrillation and early CPR. So if you get to them fast after they've had that boom, boom, and now that they're dead, because what you did is you created such a mass pat to the to the chest, the heart was like, oh God, I don't know what to do. And you did. But they will respond to good CPR, good defib early defibrillation, and good ventilation. So you can create uh, energy back into the heart. You can shock it back into a rhythm. These are more commonly associated in sports injuries, uh, but should be suspected in all cases a person is unconscious and unresponsive after the chest blow. So football injuries are your ones that you're gonna see this. If they take this wild, crazy kind of hit, y'all know what I'm talking about, that just makes them look like a teddy bear, they fold them up. So when that happens, what we wanna do is we wanna suspect that Komodo cordis and, and wondering is that, oh my God, is this what's gonna happen? Because they're going to be unresponsive. And as soon as you check for a pulse, you're like, oh, God, we got to break a sweat. It, he, he, he did. We got to fix this. All right. So laceration of the great vessels. You will see tachycardia and hypotension. But into the greater point of it is, if there's any laceration, they're going to bleed out if they're not sitting on the operation table. Um, you are going to perform CPR. Most of the time, not going to work, but it is what it is. Um, immediate transport, obviously, if we recognize that, anybody that you go to that's unresponsive and unconscious, it's, that's automatically going to warrant a rapid transport. So if you're going to take them and try to figure out, they're like, oh, no, we can stay here and do CPR. No, nah, bro, I want to go. Um, I, I've always, you need to make sure too that, that you're ready to go, you got your equipment. So when I talk about these things in preparation of rapid transport, I like to prep my truck before I go on service. Once I leave a call, I'll reprep it or I'll make sure certain pieces of equipment are with me at all times. I'm never the guy that goes into any facility without anything. Even if I'm picking you up for transfer, I've at least got my monitor and I've at least got a small supply on most of our stretchers we have little supplies right there i've got something that i can get you to the truck with if i'm uncomfortable what's going on i'm always going to take my monitor in my bag because what happens if fire is like oh well the aim is going to bring their stuff and now all of us are like sitting and getting because none of us did our job we failed and that's where we all look bad is because we failed each other and that's it told you it wasn't a whole lot um any questions on chest injuries? Nope. There's your code for the night, y'all. I hope y'all have a great night. 716, question mark, 67. That is your test code. Um, have a great weekend. Good luck at your test. Tuesday night, I will make sure I have a good, I'll have a, the right chapter up and going for y'all because uh, I've got everything you need for it. Good luck again. Y'all have a wonderful night. Great weekend. Good luck on your test. And I will mute and turn off the mic. If y'all need something, just ask me. Give me a second. Turn my mic back on. Good luck to y'all. Have a good night.
Have a good night. All right, thanks. Good night.